I will call the meeting of the union number union 38 school committee to order at June Thursday, June 18th at five o'clock PM. This meeting is a virtual meeting and is being recorded. We have, I believe, full attendance according to my records. Um, I would note one thing, Darius, for the, for the um, Union 38 committee, the voting members in the Deerfield School Committee this year will be Kenneth Cutterback, David Sharp, and Carrie Etchells. Uh, Trevor McDaniel will not be the voting representative for the coming year. So or Trevor. <laughs> so if you get Trevor being not being at the meeting, get food right. 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 You gotta be gotta represent. Is 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 Frontier called to order or Frontier's not here, so Oh that's right. It's not no Frontier this time. Good job. That's correct. I completely forgot. We missed public, them already. Public comment. Do, I notice a, a large number of people listening in. Do we have anyone that wants to make a comment? If so, I do. You know, I would recommend that you ask them to put it into chat, and then you can yes. go into the chat and ask oh, them yes. and, and call on them that way. Yes, that's a great idea. If you just would chat, note in chat that you'd like to make a comment, I can respond that way. Thank you for the uh, tutorial, Darius. <clears throat> So Holly Johnson says she would like to comment. So Holly, <clears throat> excuse me, go ahead. Hello, I have a brief statement I'd like to read. I'm a parent to two girls at Waitley and one at Frontier. I'm co-president of the um, Waitley Elementary School PTO. And I am co-chair of the Frontier Regional Union 38 Special Education Parent Council. Um, you may have received an email from me from the CPAC last week, just um, as an yes. introduction. And one of the PAC's duties is to meet regularly with school officials and school committees to participate in the planning and development of special education programs. Um, as speaking on behalf of both the PTO and the CPAC, asking that parents be more included in the fall back to school planning process. Currently, as far as I know, there isn't a parent rep representative on any of the eight committees other than employees of the district that may also be parents. I know parent surveys are being developed, but that's not quite the same as allowing parents to be a part of the discussion. And we believe it is important that we are included. Uh, parents have been with children throughout this quarantine, helping them with their lessons, and often we have been their teacher. You have not seen our children in person since the quarantine began, and this situation has changed them quite a bit, and they're not the same children that left the school in March. Um, I know some children are really worried about getting sick if they just touch each other on a playground. And even with that worry, the instinct to play closely is so strong, they, they touch each other um, a little bit anyway, and then they are having that anxiety after the experience well into the evening, worrying um, if they've done something wrong, if they're going to get sick. Um, it could be August before the district informs parents of their plans for the fall, and families need time to form a transition plan. We can't be expected to drop our children off on the first day of school to a brand new situation without an adequate transition time in August. Parents are looking for answers now and are trying to decide now if they will send their children back at all. We see the guidelines coming from the state and we see the plans put forth by other school districts, but we don't know what is being discussed in our district. And families need to make their plans now. Um, will they be homeschooling alone? Will they opt for remote instruction? Will remote instruction be offered? Is it going to be a partial week or partial days? If so, how would we coordinate our work schedule around that? The CPAC recently did our own survey of CPAC parents, and 90% of respondents felt their ch child's needs were not adequately met during the closure. 30% are not comfortable sending kids back in the fall, and 50% are unsure if they would be comfortable sending them back. They had many concerns specific to students on IEPs and 504s. Socially distancing and wearing masks will be hard for everyone, but especially kids with special needs, um, with speech needs and social issues. A hybrid of in-person and remote learning could have a huge impact on kids with ADHD or autism spectrum disorder who need a consistent routine to function. 
Families want more communication and collaboration was also put forth from the survey. DESE has formed a return to school working group to help develop a plan for the fall. The group includes teachers, superintendents, city officials, and five parent members out of a group of about 46. Why are there not parent members on the local level? Parent families want that communication and to collaborate. Parents that I have talked to will be deciding whether or not they're gonna send their children back to school in the fall. I've talked to parents, choice parents, who are looking at other districts, who are looking around for their best options. And I have talked to parents that are researching, pulling their kids out of public school entirely and looking into homeschooling. We need to be active participants in the plan for the fall. And we feel as parents, we have valuable insights to offer. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, I. I will defer to some of what you're you're asking about and talking about are questions that indeed we do not have yet at the uh, union and regional level, but we're on our first informational meeting for the full committees tonight. Um, so you'll probably hear some answers to your questions uh, as to par parental involvement on the committees. I can't speak to that. I will. I'm going to be turning the uh, floor over to Darius. Uh, if we have no other public comments, I've got to get back in to see if I had anyone else indicate a, a desire to chat. Uh, give me a moment. Okay, there, there are no other people indicating that. So I'm going to be turning, thank you for your comments. Um, and can I, I just, certainly, can I just make a comment? Who are we? Um, I can't see. Maybe you can't see me. I'm a teacher at Sunderland Elementary School. And I just very briefly, I just wanted to thank the school committee for all their support during this extraordinarily challenging time for schools and education. And to my colleagues, I just want to say thank you for all your support. We really, truly, collectively innovated what teaching and learning tried to look like. We did our very best. Um, thanks to our IAs, all our essential workers and everyone from administrators to staff and um, support for really um, helping us make this work. Um, and thanks to all the parents who turned their dining rooms into classrooms. Um, you are all really essential workers and we really appreciate the support you gave us. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. So um, Darius, I will now turn it over to you. Um, yeah, before I jump in, um, Shelly, do you want to just give a brief overview because because we don't have the um, broken up meetings. Um, oh, that's speaking. right. She was just going to give a, it's not yes. on the agenda, but she usually just gives an update. I just wanted the, the committee members to know where things are um, from the business office financially. It's not much news, but I want her to tell you that. Absolutely. <laughs> By sure. all means. So there's not a lot to report at this time um, on changes from our last meeting, projections of what we talked about and agreed upon for frozen spending for FY20 and support of FY21 are still on track. Um, I did email out the memo as per usual that listed all of the warrants since we're in a group meeting. Um, we can drop those into the notes. I'm not going to read through them all right now, but all of the schools have processed two warrants already this month, except for Sunderland. The second batch for Sunderland is currently in process. Um, and then when we have individual meetings next month, I will be soliciting some feedback next time we have individual meetings on how this process is going to make sure that it's working for you in the way that it's working for our office, just so that we have some open dialogue about the um, electronic warrant process. Um, and there's nothing new on the FY21 budget. Um, I know that that's on the agenda a little bit later, but I don't have anything other to report on that either. Okay. Um, if I could just one second, Shelly, I, I want to compliment you on the, the electronic signing of warrants. I think that's a a big step. I haven't had a chance to talk with Town Hall yet, but I would assume it's making their life easier too. I, mean, I don't know if Trevor's gotten that feedback or not. But yes, I have. I've talked to them, um, and they, they are very pleased with the way it's working. It's great. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so back to Darius. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go through and set up. Um, well, first, I just want to say, you know, congratulations to um, I guess all the faculty and staff today was the finish line that we that we we got to and I, I sent a note out but it basically it was, it was a long it was a long haul this spring and they did a lot of in the, the um, 
when Uncle was said earlier, they did a lot of things that were outside the box that, you know, the, the, a lot of learning on the fly. And then a, lot, a big thank you to parents who also had to take on a lot of um, extra roles that they weren't normally um, prepared to do. And, you know, in the end, I think, um, I think we made it to the finish line. You know, as we said, it was not the same to bounce off what Holly said. Um, you know, it was not the same as being in person. Um, I think that um, remote learning, you know, we did the best we could in the circumstances and we're hoping to learn from what we did um, this spring in, if, in a, if there's a case where we have to be remote in the fall. So I'm gonna kind of run through our, our, our planning process with everybody here. I also have um, Kim McCarthy and some of the principals in the wings that might be asked to jump in to help me um, kind of make sure I say everything correctly and um, don't forget important things. Um, whoops, I started to go to share my screen without sharing my screen. Um, I'm gonna give you just a general overview of where we are at um, with how we're setting things up, the committees that were developed and what those committees responsibilities are. And I will also try to address some of Holly's concerns um, within that as, as I see them, but you as the school committee can, can chime in there. So um, I'm just gonna share my screen. And it should be there now. And then I'm going to present this. Did that work? Yes. Good. Yes. All right. So those of you who were on the joint committee, uh, the uh, Frontier Committee last night, you're going to have to bear with me as we're going to repeat a lot of what was said last night. Um, but basically, what the, the chairs got together and why we're we're so we're set up the way we are right now. Probably um, an important question. Um, we were going to do a joint meeting, uh, both the secondary uh, with Frontier and the elementary. The chairs felt that we should divide the two meetings um, in case there's a lot of um, questions or feedback that'd be more related to um, one age group than the other. Um, but right now, the, the planning committees that are gonna talk about this are being, we're acting as one district um, um, talking about this. And so, and I'll go into more detail, it'll make more sense as I go through it. So here are some nice pictures. This is where we were before the closure. Get some nice, you know, nice action shots of students learning um, at both levels. We got to kind of see the kids here on the last day of school. And then we had during closure, things kind of changed drastically as we went to on online and virtual learning um, and then activities um, away from the computer. So the goal of the planning is, is basically, you know, we want to make sure we have a collaborative approach um, that we are looking at the safety and well being of our students, that we are supporting adaptive environments. Um, for both the faculty, staff, students, and families, and then a positive social, emotional, academic learning outcomes for all. So with, with those general questions, let me go a little bit further, we also are looking, you know, as the top priority being health and well-being, and we have to follow the recommendations that first are put out by the CDC, and we don't have the state guidelines yet. And the state guidelines are gonna be crucial. I have a little birdie that's telling me they're probably coming out tomorrow. Um, I had a, a meeting with the commissioner tomorrow morning at 9.30. And since I met with him last Friday, him and you know, 400 of my closest superintendent friends met with him. Um, I don't want anybody thinking I'm having individual meetings with Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> but um, we, uh, you know, he basically said it'll be out Thursday or Friday. He then asked for a meeting tomorrow morning. Um, so I imagine that we're gonna get some of this guidance, um, this important guidance tomorrow morning. Um, but basically we're planning for three different scenarios. And this is also coming from leaks that we already have from the state, an all-in-person model, a, a blended model where you may be in person some days and not other days or portions of the days and not other days, and then an all-remote model. Um, there is the concern that um, in the back of our minds and as we're seeing the re-emergence of the virus in different portions of the country, and we have these hearing these talks about a second wave that we also at the same time have to be prepared that we have to go back to remote learning to this time be prepared um, to put the best um, the best product moving forward. So basically we, we, we created eight groups, um, subcommittees. To, um, the final, one of the groups I just talked about to kind of remove from the list is the summer instruction. Um, by the time we kind of rolled out these communities, committees, we've already went ahead just to put to forward summer instruction, what that can look like. And summer instruction is evolving, getting, um, Right now we're starting out with virtual summer instruction because that's what we had at the time to start planning with the possible of doing some in-phase stuff a little bit later, possibly into August. But we're still um, waiting, they actually the, waiting on the, the final guidance from the state on that. 
Um, the other committees, I'm going to go through, um, I think it's easiest to explain by looking at our doc that I sent out to school committees. I'm just going to click on this. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a live document, meaning that it, it's changing. Um, woo, this document looks a bit long. It is very long. Um, but it breaks, it breaks down our groups. We have a governance group that's basically made up myself, Kim McCarthy, and Sarah Mitchell. That's basically making sure the groups are working and they're meeting their outcomes. Um, and then um, putting together uh, what's going to happen from those groups. So each one of these groups has a series of, I would say, questions that they're answering, and I'm going to show you what those look like. And the process of this is that they're going to come up with solutions um, in possible scenarios of what school can look like in the fall, and then it has to come back to school committee. You guys are the governing body of the, the, school, of the district, and um, we're going to have to present to you what we want to do, and it has to be approved by um, by school committee and also by the Board of Health. But um, if we follow all the, those measures, we will be um, likely um, doing what the Board of Health does. So first of all, we have you know facilities and safety. This group plans will plan the facility use, the guidelines in all the buildings, including cleaning, sanitizing, room arrangements, physical um, distancing requirements, et cetera. Obviously, this is if we're coming back in person. And, and to what degree we're coming back in person. The meat of this document that I shared um, with you and has also been shared, um, you know, a, the teachers also have copies of this. You can see the members of each group there on the right. Um, the meat of the document is this right here in column. And I'm gonna go to um, school operations, which is probably one of the, the heftier loads because they're basically looking about what does the school site look like and how will operations happen if students are here. So if I click on this school operations, listing and i apologize for those who went through this prior to the meeting but i did say i would walk through it because there is a ton if you were to look at this is just the planning for the fall if you take all, all these pages of all the sub pages here it's probably 30 pages of just the planning of the of, the, of what has to happen in the fall and you can kind of see going through that you know what is you know what are the safety um actions of each school you know what does it look like you know um what happens if we have cases of covid you know, how are we communicating that? Um, we have to look at transportation. How does how do we do arrivals and dismissals? I mean, we look at and we look at we have four different schools. Again, I'm talking about elementary school and our focus there in this in this meeting. Um, we have different size schools, so this means something different to each schools. But I do want to move together as one district. Um, there's a lot of we are also one union for, for the teachers in IAs, and so we want to make sure that um, you know we're working together on that. Um, but if, if you look at if you're uh, a resident of Deerfield, you know, drop off and dismissal looks very differently than if you're a resident of Conrad, you know. And so dropping off 60 uh, first graders looks a lot different than dropping off 20 first graders. So um, and, and what does that look like? How do you do social distancing as they enter the building? So these are all things that are being thought about. And as you're hearing from other districts and I'm on and I know what other districts are doing, I'm on the calls with those superintendents and, and hearing where they're at and what their approach is, um, we're, we're not behind other districts. Some of larger districts are, um, I think their deadline to, to be able to get that out there to get the what they need in each one of their buildings because of their sizes, maybe have to be a little bit earlier. Um, I believe Northampton, this is all, I believe, public documents. Um, Northampton, I think, is trying to vote at the end of the month from their school committee. I believe Amherst is trying to do the first week in July. When we talk about our schedule, we're going to be talking about the second week in July, bringing back some models to the school committee um, to review, and then with the following week, vote on. Because I, um, and when we get through this, when we get through this, you'll um, you'll see this a little bit more clearly. But as I go through this, I mean, um, there, it's as I said, it's a live document, so they're keeping notes and that kind of thing. So Kim, I'm going to ask you to talk in a second here, um, because Kim has been intimately involved with um, the day-to-day -day community work, uh, committee work. Um, on this, but Kim, do you want to jump in and just talk a little bit about you there? I can't see you because I'm sharing my screen. I'm here. Th thanks, Gary. I said my control D didn't work too well, but I'm here. I'm happy to talk to you about the committees. Um, we have a wide representation from our schools with different roles of positions that they are. And we've really come together and working very, very hard on having meetings 
uh, multiple times a week to go through these questions and to think within the three models. And it is a true collaborative approach with the voices from the teachers. And the biggest thing that we're looking at is we've learned so much about how to prioritize in this time. What is most important for us as teachers, for learners? And we're really focusing that on the integration of the social emotional well-being of children and what they need to learn academically. Academically. And so each one of us is coming through safety actions and then applying it out in three different areas, areas with the idea of going deep and rich in the things that we prioritize the most, and that is the health and well-being of our students and our faculty and a quality education. And so as, as you were talking, I was just kind of going through the curriculum development just so people can read some of the, I'm not going to read all this to you, but for those who, we got a, quite a few people watching today. Um, and for those who just can kind of see, get an, an idea of all that is on the, on the, uh, on the ticket here of, of what has to be discussed and figured out for next year. Um, and each one of these, going into each one of these, looking at, you know, um, all that has to be taken on to what does school look like? How do we do it in a safe manner? How do we keep kids both um, safe and emotionally safe because, you know, we, I've heard the early, you know, my child can't sit in a classroom with a mask on six feet away from everybody for six hours a day. And we're, we're hearing that and we understand that as well. And so these are all the things that we're putting into our planning, um, you know, our planning models here. So you can look at, we have health and wellness going through. So let me just back up where we are with school operations and we have curriculum and instructional delivery. This is really looking about how we're going to deliver the, the instruction in these different formats. Okay, we're talking about if we have to do, go back to from a blended model, if we're all back in the building. Who's going to be back in the building if we can't fit everybody at once? How will we rotate people if that's going to be the necessary kind of thing going on? We also have a health and wellness committee. Um, they're basically looking at the, what are the, the physical and mental needs of both you know, staff and students returning to schools. Um, also looking at those vulnerable students. Um, in, in, in coming from um, you know vulnerable homes, we're talking about food insecurity, um, you know, and how we're going to do all those sorts of things within these plans. Looking at technology and software, um, both back at school and if we have to go back to remotely, how can we do it better than what we did um, this spring? Um, and then we have a family and outreach, um, outreach and communication. Um, they're uh, developing the communication plan of what needs to be communicated out. How does it need to be communicated out? They're also looking at surveying parents. They have one that a draft right now that you're going to see in the next couple of days, talking about your experiences um, this spring, and then also talking some general questions about the fall. But I mean, we, we're going to need to do a lot of surveying of parents because we need to know the numbers about pe where people are. But it's also very hard to survey people about what do you think about coming back to the school and we don't we don't have the plan in front of you to say I yay or nay to. And I know, you know, Paul, you mentioned in your, in your public comment there that, uh, well, looking at other districts, we are about where every other district is, okay? Um, and I would say we're ahead. This comprehensive plan is, is pretty impressive um, compared to our, the districts around us as well. You know, some of it is actually stolen from some of the districts around us as the superintendents are sharing their plans. But most people, you know, we're waiting on the state guidance about, um, you know, where we're going and, um, we're going to go back to the, the uh, reopening plan um, about where we're going and how we're going to get there. And we need time to plan. And I understand people want answers now. Um, and th th my, I'm going to be blunt coming back and say, we don't have the answers. We're working, um, we're working in, these, in these committees to get a, a lot of involvement from our faculty and staff and, and different administrators and different buildings, all with um, particular needs, all representing different students and different populations from grade levels um, to students and IEPs to um, you know, all the other factors that make up our community. So um, the game plan to move forward, and then um, I'll take, you know, questions from the committee, um, is I, I'm proposing that um, I was going to do back-to-back -back meetings on the 16th when I made this slide yesterday, but I'm thinking that we should do the maybe the 15th of July, meet with Union 38, the 16th, meet with Frontier, just so we have a smaller group so um, uh, school committee members can ask questions. Um, and such, and then be able to fire back, give us feedback on where we're at, 
to come back as a joint meeting for the 23rd, where we do the final plans for approval. Um, and then from there, um, we'll be able to, you know, communicate out what's happening with the fall. And then basically we have each of these planning groups, but these planning groups are then going to go back to each school where we're going to have to have um, each school group about how these plans are going to be implemented in each school within each of these committees. Um, and so, you know, giving the direction there. So, um, you know, that's, that's basically where we are within our planning process. And I'm gonna answer the question regarding parent input. Um, it's difficult. We had to turn away faculty members and teachers um, because you can only have so many people in these groups, okay? The governing body, which is elected, are the elected parent members in the community input is the school committee. And that's how I viewed it when I put this thing together. You know, parents can give feedback to both the school and the school committee about where they think this direction goes. But I'm, you know, I'm stacking these committees right now with, with educational professionals with, you know, it's out of the, the hundreds, if not thousands of years of experience um, to, to try to figure out an, an unprecedented time. And so I can only make the committee so big that the committees have to be able to meet during the work day. How would I select parent members and how would they be an actual representation of the parents in the community? Those are all kind of factors that the reason why I said that, the, you know, we're going to develop this with the educational professionals in the building um, and we're going to present it to our governing our governance oversight which is the school committee um, which is made up of parents and, and the parents are their you know constituents so that's the that's the reason why um, it's set up the way it is um, and because we do need to have meetings all you know throughout the day and right now these meetings if you see the meeting schedule they're happening all day long and they're already and I you know, tip my hat to the teachers who volunteered to be on these committees. Um, they're, they're trying to close up the school year and spending hours on these meetings with homework um, that they have to come back to um, and give to, to start to give guidance. So um, that's where I'm at with right here in the on, on, on step one of this of this meeting there, Ken. So I don't know if there's questions from the committee members or like what I, I I've asked them to submit questions on chat or to let you know they want to speak. So if you want to take a look at chat and see if, I mean, I've, I've seen some questions there. So um, that's how I thought we would try and approach it. If people would sort of raise their hand by sending you a note on chat and then they can speak, you could recognize. Yep, I saw Katie, you know, asked the questions regarding parent input, um, you know, and that's the, I gave you the answer. That's, that's how we move forward on this thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive, it's a, go ahead. And I just make one more comment, which is the, the role of the parent on the committee is not always just to provide input and to, um, you know, like obviously they're experts on the educational side, but having parents will help with the communication out to the community after um, and can help keep people more informed and help people feel like there's, you know, someone at the table who's understanding things as much, you know, about where they're coming from. So it's just another perspective to incorporate. And I understand it might be hard to find parents, but I imagine there may be some who would volunteer to do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I see a comment from Chaz Emmerich saying, are these documents available publicly? If not, sharing them on a read-only read basis, parenthesis, would probably be very helpful for parents and alleviate a lot of concerns about things happening opaquely. Uh, so um, I think <clears throat> Darius has addressed some of the, some of the um, Concerns. I, it, it's this is a document that's changing daily, if not hourly, and um, how it could be shared effectively is something. And Darius, I, I think Darius does a wonderful job of communicating with with the uh, Frontier and Union Thirty Eight communities. But um, I'll, I'll I'll stop talking at this point in time and let him respond well, to that. So I guess. I'm trying to make this manageable. And so you know, when you're talking about four communities, you got, we got 1,500 families, 1,500 plus, maybe 1,600 families, um, or students rather, or a little bit less families. Um, it's hard to, I mean, we can certainly share this document out there, and I think that's probably a good idea because it um, can get out to the families. I also don't want to um, overwhelm families with uncertainty as well, because there's a lot of questions on there that bring out a lot of, well, how are they going to do that? How are they going to do that? And I already, I mean, I get, you know, I get you know, 
people send me stuff that being posted on social media um, and the concerns about, you know, when an idea, an idea gets started in one of these committees can turn onto a life of its own. And I, and I'm very, I'm, I'm very cautious of that. If we started saying, um, let me throw something out there. We're going to go week on week off of school. Well, I imagine every family in this district immediately would, would, would pause and say, well, how does that affect me? That doesn't work for me. We can't do that. But we're trying to develop this, um, this, this, this plan with all ideas on the table without the, you know, it's hard enough to, you know, um, you know, to put this kind of out of the box thinking for next year um, in making sure, and I, and I had a very strong um, statement to teachers that we're leaving our, our agendas at the door and, and, and really working through um, what is best education-wise, what is best to service the students. And we also understand that child care is part of that, but it can't be the lead thing. It's gotta be safety has to be the lead thing. And um, how we're educating students has to be the lead thing. And so safety for both teachers and students, not just the students. Um, it's, it's a massive undertaking. So I, I mean, I can, the committees have already been meeting for weeks. Um, I mean, I, I could put parents on them, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm giving you. I'm giving my honest opinion. I'm not sure that it's going to change the trajectory of where things are headed. Um, on that, I mean, I could bring it up administrative meeting tomorrow morning. We can discuss that about trying to reach out to parents if that's a, a strong thing. But I also want to make sure that's, you know, parents who volunteer. Um, you know, I also have to make sure that they're representative. You guys are all uh, school committee. You're elected officials. You're elected to have your voice at the table. You know, um, do we go to PTOs and get the elected official from the PTO to represent on these committees or to sit in on those things? They're going to be able to be free to do that. Um, but it is, you know, you have to have the proper representation on that. So, um, Mike, Michael Merritt. Hi, thank you. Um, Darius, I'll just first say, um, looking at the planning document, it's a tremendous an amazing, tremendous document that's been put together. Uh, so thank you so much. And thank you to everybody that's put all of this effort and thought and time to really, you know, think of all the scenarios that we might have uh, in the fall. Um, uh, Holly, that spoke at the beginning, um, some of the things that I heard is, is that, um, parents are looking to have a voice of some kind. And so I was curious about surveys that might be coming out. And then also um, it sounded like some of the things that parents want to share, maybe they don't have a vehicle to share it. So even if a survey comes out, there might be things that they wanna say that aren't necessarily asked in the survey. Um, I'm just thinking about my own two kids that attend Conway Grammar School. And I agree, they, they are not the same kids as they were in March. And um, think trying to envision, you know, me as a school committee member, trying to envision what every, everybody else's experience has been, I, I just, I can't do it because everybody's had a different experience. And so as a school committee member, I would like to hear in some form of a survey where I could kind of get a sense of how everybody's doing. Um, just that's my question, I guess. Is there a survey that we have a, could go we have out? A I have a survey. Actually, I pulled it up on my second computer in front of me here. Um, it's it's scheduled. Is uh, you know, George is the head of the my the secondary principals in, in charge of the uh, committee. Is there anybody on the committee that's on here that knows the date they plan on sending out out? It's early next week. Is there a teacher that's here or a staff member who's on there, Lisa? Yeah, hi, um, I'm on that committee and we were finalizing the survey as of today. And then I believe it was scheduled to go out. I'm not sure where George is in that process, but um, as far as I know, the survey is completed at this point. And Lisa, there's there's open-ended questions in there that parents can give feedback on a multiple of areas. Yes, I, I saw the draft, but you're you're on the front line of that that work. Yeah, there are, there are open-ended questions mm -hmm. as well as some pointed questions, mostly pointed, but to degrees like asking parents how they 
how they think their children are faring, what was the best method um, of this remote learning for them. And then there's the uh, well-being committee also added on um, about half of the questions to look at the well-being of the students as well. So it's a fairly comprehensive survey, I feel. And Lisa, just just because I have you there, because I love it, there's nothing better than first person reporting because it, it shows that you know you're on this committee that's doing this work. Um, there's other there was talking about doing multiple surveys, is my understanding. Yes, this is just the first survey um, because we didn't know what the plan is going to be moving forward. So yeah, this is this is our like phase one survey, and there plan to be other surveys coming out. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot, Lisa. I appreciate it. Though. Yeah. I, if I could, there is just a just a quick comment. I mean, from the perspective of a, a, a grandparent and someone who does not have children in the schools anymore, um, I view the my my role on a school committee as making sure that we're and and I know that the administration and faculty are, are pointing towards this as well that that whatever provisions and plans are put in place, we are providing an equitable educational opportunity for every child in the district. And I want to stress that, you know, it's, it's important to remember that. These may not be the most convenient plans for parents and families, but they are what provide under our charge the most equitable um, opportunity for education for our children and the best opportunities for education for all of our kids and all of our families. So, um, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I, and I, and I also, go ahead. I think Elaine asked if Is that Elaine? Yes. <clears throat> she wanted to speak so much. She left a meeting. <laughs> she pressed the wrong button. Like, you know, it's tough. She'll it's be tough. back I'm right in the middle. It's interesting. They put the hang up sign right next to the, between the video and the whatever sign. And she wants to Yes, I know. Yeah. Here she is. Here she is. Go ahead, Elaine. If she's back. Yeah, you there, I, Elaine? I, but yes, I'm sorry. You know, Conway <laughs> connectivity is not always the best. <laughs> um, but I, I guess I wanted to say for those parents out there too, uh, I mean, I know this is an unprecedented unprecedented time but having been a child clinical psychologist for 30 years you know kids are amazingly resilient if the adults around them are strong and lead and um, reassure and um, are just there for the kids in an honest and clear way the kids are going to get through this just fine um, you know, it's 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 when our fears as parents start taking over and start spilling down to the kid level um, where it shouldn't um, that then they they start to get more and more anxious and afraid. But, um, you know, kids are, you know, I have in 30 years have never been, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by kids' resilience and ability to overcome many, many types of circumstances. So I guess I just want to put that out there for parents. Um, so thank you. So Ken, I, you know, just following up on what the comment was says, I will, uh, we will post this up. Um, we'll put up a view only doc, obviously. Um, right. I see Kim's nodding her head. Yes, she's probably already working on that. We'll post it on the um, all the websites so the parents can just log in there, click on it, and see what's going on. It may have to be. It may not be the what to figure out. If it's going to be that captured in time where it is right now, and we'll have to update that posting because it may not be able to be a live doc. Mm -hmm. I'll, let, I'll let Kim figure that out. Yeah. Well. Um, well. Go ahead. Can, can I go right into the next issue on this? Absolutely. So there is going to be budget implications, and so right now. Um, you know, uh, Meg Birch and the safety committee and stuff are looking at, um, you know, what do we have to buy for PPEs, even in a, um, you know, even in a mixed model of coming back or a full coming back, we do have to put in protection things for nurses, for staff members, um, for students. You know, um, there's a lot of talk about there about masks all day long. I would say that, you know, I, I did talk 
um, again with my buddy, the commissioner on that big call. Um, and I think people have to wait and see what the requirements are the map are for masks from the state. I think you're gonna see that there's gonna be some flexibility about how often students can wear masks or have to wear masks, um, given the spacing and the environments that they're in. So a lot of common sense kind of things. If you're outside and you know that kind of things, they can be off, you're more than six feet apart without movement, you know, those kind of things. Um, and they're also doing more, the younger the students are, the less, the less the requirement. So be patient on those. But even within that, we have to be able to provide um, a lot of these PPEs, okay, and those are those, um, you know, those, the protection to, um, equipment, personal protection equipment. Um, our initial survey of what we needed for the first three months of school, and this was not extremely liberal or extremely conservative, it was kind of somewhere in the middle, was $157,000 worth of equipment that we're going to need. Because you have to, just from a nursing standpoint, if you're dealing with a student who may or may have not have COVID, you have to prepare like you do. You have to have an N95 mask. You have to have a gown on. Those are all disposable. You know, a lot of these kind of things, and you have to have a certain amount as a backup. I think that number is going to come down slightly because we're also looking at market. The market's um, changing very quickly on the um, the price gouging is coming down on a lot of these supplies. And as we get the guidance from the state, I also think that a lot of students are going to be providing their own masks. Um, I think it might be the trending thing to do to have your own cool mask. Um, or you want one that fits a certain way or, you know, that kind of thing um, that we won't have to be providing every day a mask. You know, we have to have backups on staff on, on site and um, in case kids forget or, you know, that kind of thing. They have a rough morning and they didn't go in the bag and they jumped out of the car, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but those are all these this crazy planning that's taking place. But I'm just saying that number. There are some grants out there. Um, Shelly, do you want to just kind of give the brief overview like you did last night about the different money we're going after to look at to go after help pay for this stuff? Sure. So um, the, the schools themselves are eligible for a grant through DESE. Um, Kim and Sarah are working on those applications. And my understanding of it is that there will be a mix of what that money is spent on. Um, some of it might be PPE, some of it might be technology, some of it might be professional development. Um, also, the amount is limited and different by school. Um, because it's based on Title I funding. So there's a minimum of $20,000 that each school will get. And then if the school is eligible for regular Title I funding, they may be eligible for more funds. So that varies depending on what elementary school we're talking about. Um, there's also Municipal CARES Act relief available to each town, which um, the towns have gracious, gratefully asked us uh, for lists. So we put lists together for FY20 already, which included technology and then some cleaning products. Um, not very large lists because we haven't spent a whole lot in FY20 on COVID relief um, needs. And for FY21, we are still putting some lists together that could include PPE products again. Um, but until we know from the state what the requirements are gonna be, it's really kind of hypothetical right now of what we're looking at. So there are some different pockets of money that we will be able to tap into to help pay for this. And then we'll be looking at our own resources to fund. In the, the CARE Act that goes to the school, don't anybody get excited. I don't think anybody got over $25,000, right? <laughs> it did, right? I think, is that yeah. correct? Shelly, I think you got 25 or 26 and everybody, yeah. else got, everybody else got 20. So don't think that the big federal government's bailing us all out in this area. Oh, gee. <laughs> just wanna, you know, we, we talk, we talk in general terms. Let's not talk in general terms when it comes to money. You, know what I mean? <laughs> you, have, a, you have a question from um, Maureen, I believe. Can we work with the collaborative to get PPEs? We are currently working with FERCOG, the Franklin County um, Coalition of Governments, Council of Governments, yes. um, to do bulk ordering. The state is also coming out with some bulk ordering through the state. But in the same breath, the state also said to us, you may find that your own providers are cheaper and you're welcome to go that route as well. So it's kind of the, it's a mix between, we're gonna help you, but your, your providers might be better, faster and cheaper. So right now, our, our, what we started to do is we did, we did a 10% a, a order to start off. That's already ordered. I believe it comes in tomorrow. And then we're gonna start looking, we're probably gonna do a mixed bag order of, of working with different vendors because I've been talking with other superintendents where they're making orders and then suddenly it's kind of like when you jump on 
Amazon or something, you order something and then find out later it's back ordered. You know what I mean? And we're finding that with some of the vendors where you put the order in and all of a sudden, I, I, one of my neighboring superintendents, the order came in and it was only half there. They never even told her it was only, only half of it was coming. You know what I mean? So, and all of a sudden, so now she's short gowns and some other kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think we're going to spread the, not put all our eggs in one basket, go to multiple vendors, um, try to try, obviously try to keep the lowest price, but um, within the lowest price, not always go the penny for penny, the lowest price. If it's a penny or two more for a mask, we may go to another vendor just so we don't have our eggs back ordered. Mm -hmm. uh, because you got to remember, we got 270 districts all having the same problem, all going after the same supplies with no real statewide organization of how they're going to help us in that area. You, you know, um, you know, I mean, they're trying. Good. So basically what I, the, the, the next thing is the school committee summer meeting schedule. So, you know, meeting with the chairs, we basically said we were going to put this meeting together. And then I was going to come up with the two meetings in July. Um, I'm pulling up my calendar in July. Um, We pull up my calendar in July. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, we're looking at the 16th, you know, which is the second full week in um, where I'm actually the 15th here for you guys. Um, the 16th with Frontier. I think we'll do separate nights. I was talking about doing them back to back, but I'll be honest with you. About halfway through last night, I said, I can't do it. I don't have the stamina. These can be, <laughs> we don't know what kind of feedback. And I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions and answers and um, comments and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, the, the thought is that. The school committee would give feedback um, as long as well as the public, the public and school committee giving feedback on those kind of things. Um, and then we come back on the 23rd, a week later, we can go back to those committees to iron out some of the details. And then if there's, there may be, again, the committee work on this um, is still coming through. They're actually waiting for the state guidance before putting the actual scenarios together. They may have a recommended scenario or they may say, here's A, B and C you know, choose between them, we're leaning toward blank. And, and so not knowing exactly how it's gonna be packaged, it's gonna be something about like that. You know, those committees will have information about all the different options that were, you know, that were discussed. And then we kind of have to weed it down um, to one. It's very important that we, you know, um, work, you know, it's more cumbersome working together on this, but we really need to, because the amount of complications, if you do one thing in one school and not another, we act as one district. Um, we have one union as, as also a major factor in here um, as well. And um, I think we need to find a plan that fits all students. So that's the that's the idea while we're working together. So um, I basically just need the, I'm looking for that you guys agree with that process moving forward. Um, and that we'll have a meeting on the 15th and then a meeting on the 23rd and that will be the final the final thing. And, and um, the other thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it out loud as well um, it is a month away, but if you look at the calendar, um, and I said this last night, so I'll say it tonight, is I really, I'm pushing my administration to take the next two weeks off, um, including the teachers who are on those committees, they really take the next two weeks off. Mm -hmm. They know timing-wise, someone's gonna say, how dare you take the next two weeks off? I mean, the information is just coming out. But once we get that information, and once we create this plan, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a, a, a roller coaster freight train to the finish line to get school started. And my administrators need, to, they're, they're exhausted. Um, they're exhausted from this long stretch. The teachers are exhausted from this long stretch. Um, and so basically we're, we're doing the next two weeks, coming back on the, um, with immediately having meetings coming out of the, at the gate on the sixth um, and starting to put these plans together. Um, so, and we're also, when we look at other school districts around us, and I know I start getting verbal kind of too much at, at some point, but um, we're stealing all the good ideas from the districts around us as well. You know what I mean? There's no need. We are a smaller, more nimble district. And so I ask parents and families to be patient, some patience here, because we're looking at what other schools are doing, you know, um, and, and, and how they're going through that process and stealing all the good ideas. Um, and we're sharing all our good ideas, too. So we're not just thinking, we're also sharing on, on those meetings. So that's I, I, I prefer collaborating, collaborating to stealing. <laughs> good point. Good point. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll change the language there. So I guess comments on the and then the plan moving forward. In terms of the role. summer meeting schedule, right? Yeah. Additionally, usually this the school committee gets this you know, some, usually July and August off. 
Um, given what we won't know where the budgets are going to be coming through, as soon as we get a cherry sheet from the states, we may have to have individual meetings after that point to discuss, hopefully not much of an impact, but if there is an impact where we're going to need the decisions from the school committee about how we're going to address those impacts, I imagine that's probably going to come in August. So um, there'll be more individual meetings all around this if we have, start having budget issues if, when the state comes out with their budget. Um, but again, the timeline on that budget, I've got no new news on that. If anybody else has, has any news on that, they're welcome to share. But, um, you know, they're going to have something in July and then they're going to debate it out. And then I don't know when we get our copy of it. And I don't know when it's going to be voted. So. Um, uh, fun times. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, so. Did, are there any questions regarding the summer, the, the planned summer meetings, the July meetings at this point in time? If not, we could move on to the school union 38 calendar. All right, so we good? Yep. I think we're good. I don't see anybody raising a hand, so. Excellent. Um, so the school committee, I mean, the, the school calendar is in the same kind of flux as the school year. So what I, what I would like to do tonight is I would like the committee to vote on the school start date of August 27th, which is the Thursday. Um, right now, we're waiting on the information coming from the state that may give some teacher days from the school year calendar. One of the issues there is that we only have two professional development days in our calendar. We want to front load them um, because we need as much PD training as possible prior to the school year, especially if our plan involves coming back into the building, which I believe you know, we're trying to uh, lean toward an in-person um, as much as we can. Um, and we're going to need to do training because just how do we orchestrate kids coming into the building? How do we orchestrate all the different procedures we're going to have around safety, um, both from teachers and then for students and nursing and all these other kind of things that so we're going to front load our professional development days. We may be getting some days from the state. And I say that, how do you get days from the state? They may actually reduce the length of the school year by, by a day or two so that we have the day freed up um, to be able to fund the teachers to come back. Um, early to work on those things. So, but what we really need to do, parents do need to know, like, when are we going to start school? You usually start around here. Um, we also don't know what the rollout of school is going to look like. Okay. I am at, and I know these are being talked about in the committees. When you start talking about drop-offs, especially, you know, younger students of first and second grade, um, you know, we're almost needing an orientation day because you, you can't just do the old style of parents coming into the classroom and, and helping with those students who are in trouble with the transition, you know, you know, the, how do kids get out of the cars? Especially the larger schools, 60 at a time in each grade. Um, and how do we organize them? So we may have to have a rolling start. And so the committees are discussing this. So I, it's a tentative day of the first day of year. Then once we have that, I'm going to come back with a full calendar for the full school year to come forward on that. So um, again, patience on that. So, so you're looking, so you're looking for a motion to uh, set the opening day of school as August twenty seventh, two thousand twenty. So moved. Yes, I'll second that, Trevor. I we have Trevor seconding. I didn't hear who that was. So moved. That was Philip. 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 Good to see you. <laughs> okay, Philip and uh, Trevor second. And do we have any other question? I see something from Chaz Emmerich for posting read only docs. Oh, you have a thank you there, Darius, that you can read. But uh, I don't see, does anybody else have a question or anything or are we ready to vote? We'll do this on a roll call. I will call the voting members of each committee uh, of each town and uh, you can respond if you're here. Don't forget to switch your microphone on. So control D. Yes. E Elaine. Is Elaine still here? <laughs> oh. I, yes. I don't hear. Oh, yes. OK. Michael Merritt. Michael out there still. 
Yeah. Philip. Okay, yeah. Philip. Yes. Yep. Philip. Yes. Um, Gregory. Yes. Peter. Yes. Maisie. Yes. I should probably be saying last name, shouldn't I? Kenneth Cutterback. Yes. David Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Katie Edwards. Yes. Bob Halla. Yes, sir. Maureen Nichols. Yes. Okay, so we have a unanimous support for opening on August 27th, Darius. I mean, Ken, uh, Katie asked the question of, will we have school the 28th? Yeah, the, the game plan is be to come back for two days. Um, and then we're gonna come back and discuss the following week. I do have concerns about five full days the following week, um, but we're also at that point, we'll know if we have, maybe we can put a professional development day in there to break it up. We just talk about the younger kids who haven't been to school in six months. I know some of the parents would love to get them out of the house for five days straight, um, but some of the younger ones, that's gonna be an exhausting week. Um, we usually try to, we try to stack the week so that we have a little bit, a little bit longer before we get to a full week. So we'll talk about that more when we come back with the calendar. Right. But okay. the idea is I really wanted to get a two school days um, in before that weekend because that weekend really allows teachers to adjust mm -hmm. the craziness of the first two days of school. And so those of you guys kind of know out there, even parents adjust for the first, you know, oh, we need to get there. You know, it's this kind of, you have that, there's so much energy in those first two days. People are exhausted. Even the kids are exhausted after two days because you're, you're excited for two days prior. It seems to get me excited. All right. <laughs> oh. yeah. um, okay. so. The next thing um, was actually brought to my attention um, by Jessica um, that this has gone out to, I believe, the school committee members. And you know what? I'll share my screen. Where the heck is it? Did you want to do the school meeting calendar, school committee meeting oh, calendar? Thank you for following the order of the agenda. Before you jump to COVID 19 resolution. Thank you, sir. Um, school committee agenda, um, I'm asking that maybe we just, right now, we know that we may have more meetings in, in, in August, given, can we just go ahead and vote the tentative one that was sent yeah. out, which is basically right. a model of last year's, yep. and then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it as it comes forward. That kind of gets us meetings on the books. Yep. Um, I think these virtual meetings take a little bit more time, but we'll, we'll figure it out. We're, we're, we've become a very agile group. <laughs> So, uh, so my suggestion would be a a um, a, a, uh, a motion to approve the school committee uh, frontier region frontier regional union thirty eight school committee schedule for 2020 2021 sub subject to change and with the addition of uh, the July dates of July fifteenth sixteenth twenty third would it be the um, 24th or 22nd for the Union 38 ones? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, Ken, my, my opinion on this is that it just gives us um, people scheduling. It allows right. people to schedule their meetings. Yes. It's the real means we put the calendar out. I do, I want to say for the public, the school committee can call a meeting within 48 hours, less than right. that if it's an emergency, yes. at any time for any reason. So um, I'm just saying that because we do move things around when necessary. Um, I, so I, I'll, I'll revise it just to say that to approve the school committee schedule or school committee calendar subject to change and as presented. I'll second that. Okay. And that was, uh, was that, what's that, Trevor? Trevor, yep. Okay, um, I'm assuming no further schedule. If we could take a vote again, I will do another roll call. Elaine? Yes. Michael? Michael yes. Merritt? Yeah, Phil? Yes. Yeah. Gregory? Yes. Yes. Peter? Yes. Maisie Shaw? Yes. Kenneth Cutterback? Yes. David Sharp? Still out there, David? Yes, sorry, yeah. Carrie, Carrie Etchells? Yes. Katie Edwards? Uh, yes. Bob Halla? Yes, sir. And Maureen Nichols? 
I hear a yes there faintly in the background. So it was again unanimous. Now you may move on, Darius. So I'm going to, um, basically this resolution that I'm, I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing it so that people at home know what we're talking about. It's easier than, um, this is the resolution that we want to send to our, oh, I had the one that we had edited, but it had our state senator and representatives on it. Um, but basically sending a note to our state reps and the, and the governance of our, um, of our state that this, the going back to school again is a um, is it's, it's an unfunded mandate, and they didn't even be aware of that um, that we should be receiving. You know, I think the resolve at the bottom is that the state must guarantee that every school district receive full reimbursement for whatever COVID nineteen expenses are required to follow the state mandates. We continue to get these directions by the state, as you guys are all well aware. Um, and you know, I would like to send this out from. I would like to send it out from each chair of each committee, not just the union. I, I think it'd be more of an impact that each committee chair um, send this out. So that we send a message that, you know, this is costing us money and it's not being funded. And you need to be knowing that we know and we're watching. Michael Merritt says he can't see the document in spite of your uh, sharing. So it was sent out as part of your packet, Michael, but uh, can you guys see it? Can everybody else see it? I'm sharing my screen, right? It came out with the agenda, yes. But can you see my shared screen? I can see your shared screen, but apparently Michael couldn't. Well, he's probably on his phone. It's really small. Oh, that could Continue, be. Mike. <laughs> <clears throat> Most other people can see it, so. Try pinning the document, Ben says. Um, um, it's just a very, oh, there it goes. It finally, it finally just popped into view. I think it was just a delay in the video. Thanks. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so do you, do you want, uh, you know what, if you do just do a roll call vote, that'll give us a vote for each of the chairs to send because you'll have a majority on each of the committees. Okay. We'll do a yes. roll call. Phil. Roll call vote for the entire, all committee members. This will be all committee members. So if your name is called, please remember to activate your microphone. Elaine Campbell. Was that a yes? <laughs> Michael Merritt. Yes. Philip Cantor. Yes. Ashley Dion. I don't know if she's out there. Uh, great. Uh, Denise Storm? Yes. Gregory Galshaw? Yes. Peter Gagarin? Yes. Maisie Shaw? Yes. Keith McFarland? Yes. Jessica Corwin? Yes. Kenneth Cutterback? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Katie Edwards. Yes. Bob Halla. Yes, sir. Maureen Nichols. Can you just tell me what the vote is on? Because I got kicked off. Oh, it's it's on um, the COVID-19 resolution saying that uh, we do not want unfunded mandates. Okay. Yes. Maureen. <laughs> okay. Great. It's unanimous across all committees. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. and, and as Phil said, uh, Philip said that we had to make sure we had Adam Hines as he's the he's the senator for representing Conway. And we, we recognize that last night at the frontier meeting. And Donna's going to take care of that. And Donna's listening on and she's going to make that happen. <clears throat> Great. Um, <laughs> we move on. Can you hear my background music here? Evaluation of superintendent's job performance. <laughs> So um, I sent out that the uh, the uh, the form uh, for the survey earlier this week. Um, I don't believe you had enough time, given the fact that we only had about four members from the elementary had filled it out um, when I checked in with Donna this afternoon. Um, so I guess we should probably put that off the next meeting. I do hold all the responsibility on that. It's been 
it's been crazy. And it was one of those things I had to put together and put all that information in and get it out to you. And I didn't get out to you this week. And it really, a couple of days was not enough time for all of you to go in and, and do that. So, um, so, um, so why don't, go ahead. Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we treat this as a homework assignment that it be completed um, by the 8th of July? So there's a week to process it before the meeting on the 15th. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. And, and I think, it, I think that that probably would be good and the chairs can discuss how they want to just to discuss them. Right. Cause it's kind of yep. it's squishy about how you can exactly do it. And, and I don't care yes. that much how we do it. Okay. That, that seems reasonable. And uh, if, if no one, if someone on the, the one of the committees did not receive the evaluation um, email from Darius, please let Donna know so that she can get it out to you. I'm being told I'm still presenting. Is that true? It doesn't say it on my screen. Huh. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. You're front um, and center. So oh, that's good. I think. Um, so can can I just add something to the, the new business? Because um, I think it's important that I did, and I, I talked about this last night as well. Sure. Um, you know, basically, I made up this. You know, the agenda was from a while back, and so I didn't get it. I didn't update it before it was reposted. Um, you know, following the murder of George Floyd by a police officer, I sent out a uh, a document from the leadership. With the leadership of the town sent up a document together to to address the community and we received a lot of feedback administration and i and we had we had several meetings and we felt that um, we needed to do more than what was said in that letter um that initial letter and we came up with a uh in another letter um that kind of pointed out i sent that out last friday and you should have all received it so i just wanted to talk a little bit about um you know we as a school are um looking at ourselves and what we are doing to look at equity in our schools, looking at racial diversity and racism in our schools. We right now are creating a committee um, called the uh, Anti-Racism and Equality Committee. It's coming out of Frontier where there's already a student group in place. And Scott Dredge has taken the lead with um, Kelsey Crop is one of our guidance counselors. And they reached out to parents in our community and leaders in the elementary schools of the current groups that they already had in the elementary schools that were doing work around this to try to get a movement district wide in planning district wide, not only curriculum, um, but looking about what we're doing as a community and so forth. And so I just wanted to mention that in this, because a lot of this is on our minds right now as our nation's struggling with this. Um, and then what are we doing as an educational body around that? So we have some things in place, but we can always do more and do better. Um, and, um, and, and this is the work they're going to do. So they're really doing some planning over the summer for the fall to kick off on this. So, um, great. So I just wanted to kind of mention that because it, it did go out in, in an email. Um, but I took a chance to talk about okay. it. All right. Very good. Um, so is that it? Is that Can it? For Rick? Yes. What was that? Um, I, I just a quick question for Darius. The um, that uh, what you referred to, I think, really hits students at the school level. But do we have anything in terms of human resources um, to uh, either attract or retain more uh, teachers or employees of color? You know, we don't. We struggle. Um, we struggle, and I, I talk about this even uh, with area superintendents um, getting um, applicants of color. Um, let, you know, in the sense of even recruiting and um, and so forth in that area. I mean, I'd be open to hear any ideas about how we can do more around that. It's very difficult, um, you know, in talking about this in a large public forum like this. It's very difficult to get applicants of color when. Um, they are so sought after by so many districts. And it's very difficult also to, um, I, I don't know what we can do more. We are very, uh, be very blunt, we're a very white community. Um, and to be attractive to um, employees of color, you know, 
I'm open to ideas about how we can get more applications because quite frankly, um, even in my role as principal, saw very few in, in, my, in my entire time in administration at that level. Um, and you know, I don't know what we can do to make our district tractable, attractive for um, employees of color because we do need more diversity um, you know, in our teaching ranks. And I think this is a statewide problem. I, I talked with a group in, uh, I think it was the superintendent, I don't get the name, the town wrong, I think it was Randolph, where they, they you know, they, their percentage was, you know, I think like 10% teachers of color and their diversity was 60% students of color. Um, and they, they couldn't, they can't find enough applicants. They started creating a teacher program in their buildings um, for high school students to get more students um, to go into the teaching profession. Um, and so I hear what you're saying, Keith, um, but we don't have anything in, in place. And maybe I can ask the committee to also look at that as well. Um, but I also, if there's anybody out there listening who can give me um, references, ideas there too, but I know it's a struggle um, for, for most districts. And I know Amherst has done some things outside the box. Yeah, but I would say that we also still struggle with it as well. Um, it's difficult, but I just think it's something we, sh we need to take a kind of a two pronged approach. One would be to provide for students, but then the, it, administratively or in, in terms of employees, we have to make some efforts in, in that regard. So I just mm -hmm. need to think about going forward. This is Trevor. We need to make that effort as, as a town as well in, in all aspects of, you know, of, of town life and not just our schools. So I'm thinking hard about that as well. And I, I went to an MMA conference in um, Boston last year and the, the, the League of City League of Cities um, had, had a great program. And I was kind of looking into that a little bit to see what, you know, what we could do on a on a town basis here. Um, I'd love to group in the schools on that. So definitely looking at something in the future, what we can do to to try and expand on that. So. Trevor, this is Philip. This just, I mean, I've been looking at this too, and from a Conway's point of view. And the the thing about our town's history is that in the 1970s and even into the 80s, all of our towns used to sponsor refugee families. Yep. To bring them into the community, um, and create more diversity. And that has all fallen by the. And a lot of that was in partnership with churches, which now yep. right no longer have the, the the population to participate in that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's death to me. That's that's the direction to go in. Yeah, it's a great idea. And, you know, uh, Lexington did it did a big study with this uh, League of Cities to to um, to try and, you know, kind of break that down and figure out, you know, just recognizing the problem at, for one and, and looking at ways to 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 fix that. So um, I'm excited. I'd love to work with you on it for further, too. So it'd be great. Uh, we, I noticed a couple of comments here in the chat column. Kim, Kim has said that we had a beginning plan for COVID before COVID, and we're going to go to local colleges job fairs this spring, uh, this past spring, I assume. Um, Denise Danak is saying actively involving student interns from the university colleges into our schools is another idea to consider. Um, so uh, for those of you that haven't seen those in the chats. Those suggestions are there as, and, and notes are there as well. So thank you for that, Darius. Um, and thank you for, you know, taking leadership and in, in getting the, the initial correspondence out from the school uh, last week. It was good. It was good to see. So. And we are at the end of business. Are we moving to executive session? Ken, Ken, Ken before we do, this is Philip. Um, just oh, one, yes. one little announcement, and that's just, you know, we're halfway through the most important school days in the calendar, which is annual meetings. So for all those that are listening, Conway's is Saturday uh, afternoon. Waitley's is Tuesday. If you are listening to this and you live in those communities, please come to town meeting, mm -hmm. vote on the school budget, and stay to vote on the playground. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. So, so does that bring us to executive session, Darius? Yeah, we um, we do not need to go to an executive session. Okay. Um, I'm not we, hearing anybody. We had, a, we had a negotiations committee meeting prior to this meeting. 
um, and the, the group wanted to reconvene um, next week to discuss further. So we, we don't, um, I'm gonna guess if they, unless there's members of that committee, I think we should go into that into, into executive committee in no, executive I, session, so. I think you're right, okay. we'll wait. Okay, all right. Then I can entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Who was that? That was Phil. Phil. I'll second. Oh, it's Phil and, Phil and Trevor? Yeah. The Phil and Trevor show. That's right. <laughs> And uh, I'm assuming I'm not going to hear any further discussion. I will call the voting members again. Elaine Campbell. Yes. Michael Merritt. Yes. Philip Cantor. Yes. Gregory Gottschalk. Yes. Peter Gagarin. Yes. Maisie Shaw. Yes. Kenneth Cutterback. Yes. David Sharp. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Uh, I'm sorry, oh. Carrie Etchells. Yeah. <laughs> Katie hey. Edwards. Yes. Robert Halla. Bob, you still there? I think Bob left to go to executive session, so oh. I just texted him that there is none. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would vote in the affirmative. And Maureen Nichols. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all for your time this evening. Thanks, and Steve. Darius pass on our committee's appreciation for all of the efforts of your faculty and administrative team. Second uh, that. So That's a thank you all. See Great, you all. Thank you. Yep. See you soon.